How many of you have ever had an experience that was so intense and abrupt that you knew from one split second to the next your life was never going to be the same again? My moment came October 7, 2014, and that was the day that ego caught up to and destroyed me. That day, I got a phone call informing me that a reporter had dug up my past. He had discovered that many years earlier, I had been involved in a green card marriage for money, and that was around the same time that I had been uh, uh, involved for a little while in a planned marijuana growing operation. Now, that call wouldn't have been so wildly terrifying if it weren't for the fact that at the time, I was the long-term partner and fiancé to the governor of Oregon, who was running for re-election. I had made the terrible mistake of getting into a high-profile public position without being totally honest about my past. When the story dropped, the media went wild, and not just here in the Pacific Northwest, all the way across the country, I eventually wound up in the inglorious pages of UK tabloids. <laughs> Overnight, I became clickbait and the most humiliated person in all the circles that I was running in. My mistake shredded the life of the person I love most in the world. I will get this under control. Love you. love you back. <laughs> it caused really a lot of damage to our family, destroyed my business, led to IRS and FBI investigations, and created mayhem across state government. I could not believe the enormity of it. It was surreal. It seemed so much bigger than I was. And when I realized that it was going to be years, not months, but years before we would be able to move through it, before the investigations would conclude and my work would pick back up, it literally buckled my knees. Who was I if I wasn't a successful social activist or a business owner? or even a person that other people liked. In my lowest moments, I would find myself wondering if maybe it were actually true. Maybe I really just was that ugly, valueless caricature that the media had put forward. And when my mind would start down that path, I would literally physically flinch from it. I would never have admitted it at the time, but the truth was, up until that point in my life, I had so doubted my own value that I had looked to others for validation. And suddenly, and I'd been able to run from that pretty successfully, but suddenly, everywhere I looked, I was being invalidated. Not just the media stories, my career, which seemed central to my worth, gone. 90% of the people I had considered friends or colleagues, gone. My beautiful, loving, 10-year relationship with John was fractured. I felt totally rudderless. And it took many painful, dark months for me to begin to see the glimmers of the gift that this was going to become. The experience has allowed me to see that up until that point in my life, I had been fighting like hell to keep myself safe in a house made of glass. And that house was constructed of my put-together personality, my accomplishments, my work. It's this thing called ego. And I don't mean ego in just the Freudian or superficial psychological frame, but the deeper research that describes ego as a construct, a created identity, a set of stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves. And unlike what I used to believe, it's not the thing that makes us feel puffed up and bigger and badder. It is the thing that tells us we're not enough. It's that thing that when you have just knocked it out of the park at work, the only thing you can think about is the one thing that did not get done. Or when you put out a social media post, the only comment you remember is the negative snarky one. Have you ever felt driven to do something that you really didn't want to do because you were concerned about someone liking you. That's ego. My nervousness about what you all are thinking of me is ego. <laughs> ego is also a comparison machine. I mean, I have caught myself comparing myself to someone I didn't know, feeling inferior, 
realizing that that photograph and probably that story had been airbrushed. And I'm seeing some nodding heads. It's kind, it's kind of crazy. Early on, I was at a really low point uh, in all of this, totally overwhelmed. I had spent several days on the couch, binge watching TV, drinking too much beer, being careful to keep the door locked and the shades drawn because reporters and photographers were constantly lurking around my little 960-square-foot uh, house. I literally several times saw them come up and try to look in the front window, which is right where I was laying on the couch. I could see them behind the shade. The third or fourth morning, determined to break out of that clearly unhealthy pattern, I dragged myself out to my little back deck, and I slunk down into my tiny little hot tub. And I was so shell-shocked and exhausted that I think my mind got to the point where it just could not race anymore. And something in me shifted, and I became deeply, intensely aware of the present moment. Now, that morning was really cold, like single-digit Central Oregon cold. And I had probably been in that tub in similar cold mornings hundreds of times when the steam is billowing up off the hot water. I'd never seen it before. I'd never really seen the steam or the light behind it or the ice crystal on every little pine needle. I started to become aware of these intense, rich layers of sound and the silence beneath each one. All fear dropped away. I was so present in the moment that in that instant, I lost track of my old familiar identity, even of the sense of physical boundaries around my body. And I reached this place where I disconnected my inner state of being with the swirl of stuff going on in my outer life. I hadn't known that was possible. All I did know afterwards is that I wanted more of it. And that's what put me on what has now been a three and a half year deep dive into this crafty thing known as ego. I've studied, I've researched, I've met with teachers and ministers and therapists, a few of whom are in this room. God bless you, thank you. I studied the mental and emotional habits of people who were having big positive impacts, but also seemed to be genuinely peaceful, living really dialed in lives. And I will tell you, it was painful. It was painful to be honest with myself about how ego-driven I had been up to that point in my life. And it was painful also, a little bit still, to realize how much peace and effectiveness I had allowed ego to take from me up until that point. But I stuck with it because I could sense power in it. I could sense a liberation from chains I did not even know I was wearing. One of the first big ahas was around fear. When this first broke in my life, the fear was so intense that it was like a living beast. You know when you have that moment where, or, the, or one of those nights where you're having a terrible dream, and you wake up and it's like, oh, thank God, that was just a nightmare? I cannot count the number of times during that period of my life that I would wake up and start to remember everything that was happening, and it was like waking into a nightmare. What was the latest round of media stories? What were the next death and rape threats going to look like? What was going to happen to my work? How on earth was I going to survive it financially? Was the person that I loved most going to leave me? Was he going to be able to survive and recover? At times, it was so intense that my sweat smelled different. I smelled ranker than normal. And guess what? None of it happened. Yes, it was horrific, and yes, we're still rebuilding, but my career was not completely destroyed. John and I are still together. <laughs> He's here today. <laughs> Our family is healthier than ever, and to this day, I have not had a single person be ugly to my face. It's all been anonymous 
or behind the shield of a computer screen or a media institution. The thing that I've come to realize from this is that unless you're in honest-to-God survival, like a war zone or a shooting scene, as we heard about earlier, or like, oh shit, that's a rattlesnake, <laughs> unless we're there, most of our fear is unnecessary, and a whole lot of it is driven by a desire for people to approve of us or see us a certain way. Mark Twain said, I am an old man, and I have seen many troubles, but most of them never happened. <laughs> so I've learned it's just useful to kind of think what fears are spiking my guts right now, keeping me awake at night, and are they really necessary? And what's it keeping me from doing? Now, I want to point out that I am not saying I have a lock on this ego thing, because I am in this glamorous leg and footwear, because a couple of months ago, I let my desire for someone's approval override my good sense. I let the horse keep galloping, even though he didn't feel settled. The next thing I know, I'm on the ground, the horse is on top of me, the person I was trying to impress is calling the ambulance. <laughs> I literally let ego take the reins. That was not the kind of impressiveness that I was after. I can, I can tell you that much. But what I do know is that it is much better to get a handle on what it is that's really driving our decisions and our reactions before we break our leg or our lives. How do you go about that? Well, you could orchestrate a catastrophic public shaming. <laughs> I can tell you it can be effective. It's a little extreme, and I don't recommend it. And I am learning that there are much gentler ways to take back the reins from ego's smallness and fear. The thing that was most important and useful to me at first was just becoming more aware, training myself to be more aware. I recognize more quickly when I've gone into comparison mode, or that little stab of guilty delight when the latest celebrity falls off their shiny platform, or noticing the tapes running, like, I'm not good enough to do that, or someone like me can't, or what's the TED crowd going to do to me today? Just in that moment, or in that, in that practice, I feel like I've begun turning ego into a friend. It's a teacher showing me where I am still practicing habits of not-enoughness. The second thing that was really useful was just a gentle redirect. When I find myself starting to get caught up in those habits, I just say, choose again, choose again. Sometimes I have to choose again 300 times a day, but eventually it shifts. The second or the, the third piece that's been incredibly helpful and that I just really have to give a shout out to is meditation and mindfulness. Every single person that I studied who seemed to be living a dialed in life of peace and purpose has some sort of meditation practice on board. I believe it's one of a handful of things literally that may have saved my life. It is definitely not the first thing that falls off my plate anymore. Related to that and a little newer, is just the practice of becoming aware of the present moment, and I'm realizing I'm actually doing that for the first time since I got up here, because I've been nervous. This practice of just noticing the present moment is the single most important and useful thing that I have found to be able to release unnecessary fear. When I start to get spun around the axle of how am I going to pay that bill? What's she going to think of me when she finds out? Dot, dot, dot. Coming back to present moment helps me decipher which is completely out of my control and I might as well just quit wasting energy on, and what actually merits some action. And the final tool that I will share here today, it's a huge topic all by itself, but it's just really getting down to the nitty gritty of what our core beliefs are. I'll give you one example. I fairly recently realized that I've had a lifelong belief that life is hard, but by God, I'm not going to let it beat me. I am tough and I am resilient because that's what daddy prided me on being. And guess what? I have created a life. It's a beautiful life that I'm grateful for, but it's a life where I have had to be tough and resilient. And I don't want to anymore. I don't want to have to fight my way through life. I want to be able to love my way through life. I'm flipping that belief. Thanks. 
I think in our culture, it is incredibly easy to just be saturated with a pervasive sense of not enoughness and fear. This is what drives us to distraction. It's what costs us our peace. It's what prevents us from doing perhaps our greatest acts of, of good and contribution. It's also what drives war and the destruction of our planet and then tells us we're too small to do anything about it. I now genuinely believe that we will not be our, our most effective in our outer work with our families, in our careers, and the causes that we care about until we clean up our inner work, our inner environment, by becoming much more consciously aware of what's, what's driving our decisions and our reactions. I have seen the magic in this over and over and over in my own life, in my relationships, in the work I do with my clients. There is nothing to lose by losing identification with ego. I started out this talk saying that ego had destroyed me. That's not completely true. It was my lack of awareness that destroyed me. And the me it destroyed wasn't real. It was a construct, an image, an identity that I had created. And it hurt like hell when it blew up. I'm not saying it didn't. And John and I are still massively rebuilding, legally, financially, occasionally from media challenges. But here I stand. My life is immeasurably richer, more magical. My heart is open, so much wider, and I never could have imagined how good that would feel. And I'm so much better able to stay peaceful no matter what is swirling around in my life. As that started to take hold, John would sometimes go, who are you anyway? In like a good way. I used to believe that that shiny, carefully put together exterior was protecting me. It was actually robbing me. Eckhart Tolle has said that identification with ego is a monstrous act of reductionism. In this human part of our existence, we have a chance to live two lives. There's the one spent getting up to the point where we deeply question who and what we really are, and there is the beautiful one spent expanding and opening beyond that, and we get to choose.